Hey guys, welcome to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Joseph Mavericks. I'm a graphic designer by day and a content creator by night. In the past two years, I've published over 200 articles, mostly around the topics of productivity, self-improvement, and entrepreneurship. In this video, we're gonna be talking about the four things that had the most impact on my life. When you think of impactful and defining moments, of course, there are some things in life, mostly on the family and friend side, that can also have a gigantic impact on your life. In fact, I always say, and I love this quote from the movie Up in the Air with George Clooney, your relationships are the heaviest component of your life. So of course, the people you grow up with, the friends you hang out with, and the environment you evolve with them in is one of the most, if not the most, defining and impactful component in your life and i might make more content on that very complex theme later on in more videos i've also worked on like compassion nurturing relationships reading the art of happiness an amazing book i recommend you read but in this video i'm only going to be talking about the decisions on the personal level without involving family friends and, and things like that so yeah that was just a quick note let's get started with the video So the first decision that had one of the biggest impacts on my life was uh, running a marathon. I started running years ago because I had just moved to a new city. I didn't know a single person there and I wanted to keep exercising. Some people may have chosen the gym, the swimming pool. I chose running because it was easy to do, free and time efficient. All I had to do was get out the door, come back, take a shower and I was done. And as I started training more and more, I realized it became not that difficult to run 10, 15, 20 kilometers or even a half marathon. By the way, I'm using kilometers because I'm from Europe. So if you use miles, then I don't know, just do the math, you know? No, you don't want to. Okay, I'll just put the miles at the bottom of the screen when I talk kilometers then, Jesus. Running a full marathon had been on my life goals list for a very long time. So I started thinking to myself, maybe now's the time. And as I got better and better and trained more, I decided to just go for it. I bought my marathon ticket online. I trained for 10 months on my own, sometimes with the running club. I ran four half marathons in preparation for the, the, the big marathon. I got interested in the running world. Elliot Kipchoge, the marathon world record holder, became a huge inspiration for me. And actually, the year I ran the marathon, he became the first human in history to run an unofficial marathon in under two hours, which is crazy. I mean, that's insane. I also followed Lionel Sanders and Lucy Charles, both famous triathletes. I just got really into the sport of running. But why was this one of the most impactful decisions in my life? Well, mostly because I have never felt so much pain from physical activity in my life. Actually, I once almost broke my back while sledding in Canada and that was extremely painful, but I mean, it was not self-inflicted pain. I mean, it was self-inflicted pain because I messed up sliding down the hill right into a massive metal pole. But you know what I'm saying, I chose to run the marathon. I didn't consciously choose to crash into that metal pole. Or did I? I don't think I did. So I didn't think it was gonna be that hard, the marathon. After all my training and now that I had a good idea of what I was capable of or what I thought I was capable of. So I told myself I would run this thing under four hours, which is pretty standard if you're in good shape and you've trained. And I placed myself in the pacing group with an expected finish time of three hours and 45 minutes. So I thought if I drop out, I still have 15 minutes to finish the thing. Long story short, I hit the wall, which is like when you feel you just you, you can't go anymore. I hit that wall around the 35 kilometer mark and I started majorly slowing down for the last seven kilometers. I, and I actually vividly remember, and that's when I kind of understood the pain I was in, I stopped running pretty early in the last seven kilometers. I was like, I, I, I just have to have a break, right? And as soon as I stopped, like I stopped for two seconds and my legs started burning and pulsing like crazy with pain. It was an instant release of whatever chemical in my body. So I just started running again right away or trotting again right away because that actually minimized the amount of pain I was in. But my body at this point was basically on autopilot and it was like, oh, okay, we're not stopping, that hurts. We're not doing that. We keep going. So I guess what this experience taught me is that it humbled me in a way, you know? Not that I was a cocky show off before, but I've always been pretty fit. I thought I could do this. And then I ended up finishing 42 seconds 
over my target time of four hours. And it really hurt, you know? Not just physically, but also mentally. I guess I'm pretty competitive, so I wasn't happy with that at all. And it was just so hard, you know? I actually don't even really know how to explain this. It just kind of changed my perspective on now if I have something hard to do or I'm on the run outside and it's getting a bit hard or the weather is shit and I find myself thinking, dude, you ran this thing? So this right now is a piece of cake. So get to work and stop complaining. So as you know, if you've been reading my content or watching my videos, I am a morning person. I've always been, and I'm not trying to turn anyone into a morning person or to convince them to start waking up early, but waking up early is absolutely one of the main reasons I was able to build my blog from the ground up while keeping my nine to five job. I could have never kept up with both things at the same time without waking up at 6 a.m. every weekday for about a year. And honestly, 6 a.m. is not even that extreme. Some people with kids or a long commute or both have to wake up way earlier if they want to get things done. I mean, I read stories about people having to wake up at 5 a.m. A guy I know at my work, he actually wakes up at 4.30 every morning to work on his own thing before having to take care of the kids. So I just started waking up early to work on the blog. And then I think six months or so into blogging, I did a 5 a.m. wake up challenge with a friend of mine. We woke up at 5 a.m. for a week and we had to send each other a picture of our watch every morning. And it was really motivating and a, and a cool challenge. And so the 5 a.m. challenge is really what brought me more consistency than ever. After that, six in the morning felt way easier. I kept it up for months and every morning I would wake up, get out on the terrace right here to stretch for 10 minutes, make coffee and write an article or draft. And then I would edit three of those drafts per week. And that strategy allowed me to publish two to three articles per week for the first 52 weeks, which is one year of blogging. After that, I took it a bit more easy on the articles and I focused more on things like putting together the Momentum course, working on my website. It was still a lot of work, but less on publishing articles. So the one thing waking up early has taught me is... Well, is that it's honestly the easiest way to get things done in life. I know not everyone is a morning person. I believe the science that says there are night owls, there are early birds. Some people are just unable to focus in the morning. Their brain just doesn't operate like that. But objectively, in the morning, there's no one asking for your attention, no phone calls, no emails, nothing to get in the way of your focus. It's usually very quiet. So yeah, that, that's all I'm saying. I'm lucky enough to be a morning person or to be able to focus in the morning and I usually get 50 to 75% of my workload done before 12. Decision number three. So as much as I said I'm not going to talk about defining moments with family and friends in this video, people in general can help you reach new heights and really bring your project to the next level. In fact, it is often said that in business and entrepreneurship, your social connections are your most valuable asset. At the time I started blogging in August 2019, I was looking for a way to start with a bang and to get super motivated about the project and also have a good reason to tell people about it, not just to reach out and be like, hey, check out what I'm doing for no reason. And I had read an article about blog promotion which explained that doing an expert roundup was a great way to do just that. So I decided to go with that and I started reaching out to people. I published my first interview piece shortly after that. It was a roundup of 10 medium writers with five questions per person. The piece was centered mostly around morning routines because I like to wake up early as I said to work. So. I asked people how they were doing it. Gathering all the answers and writing that first piece was hugely motivational for me. And as you know, if you've been following my content, I went on to publish dozens of interviews, 150 interview guide with over 150 pages of content and a 75 interview guide with over 200 pages of content and over 100 books and tools references inside around productivity and self-improvement. And that project is called The People Who Do. Link to download right here. So what's the one thing this project and reaching out to people in general has taught me? So I'm someone who is who is pretty introverted. I mean, I'm easygoing and I laugh and I joke all the time. And if we're at a party, I'll have a good time and laugh and, and I'm okay with that. But I don't want to get too personal if I don't know people, right? So we're having fun. But if you ask me, oh, by the way, how was your childhood? I'm not going to tell you. Also, who asks that at a party? That's just being straight up a party pooper. Why would you do that? So anyways, my point is this project made me realize that people are surprisingly approachable. I reached out to well over 100 people by now and I've had to face a lot of rejection. 
But many times I was actually surprised to get an email back from people, even if it was to decline. They took some of their time to reply to me. That's the reply. Tim Denning, for instance, who is a huge medium.com author, he got back to me and I didn't even think he would see my email. Charles Duhigg, the New York Times best-selling author of The Power of Habit, got back to me as well. I mean, these guys ended up not being part of the project because they declined, but I never even thought they would get back to me. And sometimes people did accept and did do the project. I was able to interview Laura Vandercom, the author of one of my favorite productivity books ever, 168 Hours, You Have More Time Than You Think. I highly recommend you read this book. It completely changed the way I manage my time. Atik and Tank, the CEO of Jotform, also said yes to a quick five-question interview. And Nicholas Cole, I'm a huge fan of him on Medium, he's the founder of Digital Press, and he's also my first major blogging inspiration. He also accepted and he did a 10 question interview for my project. So yeah, I learned that. Basically, you'll never know if you don't try, so do your homework, do your research, shoot out an email, and you never know, maybe people will get back to you. Decision number four, the final one of this video, committing to blogging. Committing to blogging has been one of the most life-changing decisions I ever made. For as long as I can remember, I've always been doing something on the side. I tried so many things before blogging, launching a t-shirt business, a dozen different websites, a new app, trading algorithms, selling art on Instagram. I always knew I wanted to have a side hustle, but there was only one problem. I never tried anything consistently, ever. I would pick something up and then do either one of two things. Either try it and drop it a few months or weeks later, or actually spend a ton of time developing a minimum viable product, but never launch. I would just sit there looking at the almost finished project and tell myself it was never good enough to launch. But as Mark Zuckerberg likes to say, done is better than perfect. So all these times I should have launched, but I didn't. My relationship to commitment changed when I decided to follow the six month rule and apply it to blogging. The six month rule is really simple, pick something up and keep at it for six months no matter what. Consider it like a job, be consistent, dedicated, just put in the work, don't expect anything to happen from it. Don't expect money, opportunities or good things to come your way, just show up, do the work and assess the situation in six months. And so I did that and I'm still here, oh there's pigeons, pigeons! So I did that and I'm still here over two years later and now I'm doing YouTube videos too so I guess content creation stuck with me in a way, I don't know. I remember interviewing Nicholas Cole, who I mentioned previously in this video, and I asked him, you work with top executives, CEOs and thought leaders, people who know how to get things done, basically. So I asked him, is there one big lesson you've learned from all of these guys? And here is part of his answer to the question, which I find very insightful. Every single person I've worked with has admitted to me they didn't really know what they were getting themselves into. They just decided to trust themselves and follow the path. They kept putting one foot in front of the other and trying their best to learn as they went along. And that's the one thing blogging has taught me right here. Just start. I always tell people, you have no idea how far consistency can take you. I cannot stress enough how much blogging has changed my vision of success. I haven't become a best-selling author, a famous blogger or a multi-millionaire entrepreneur, but I have made more progress on one thing than I have in all the things I've ever tried in my life before. That's crazy. It has proven to me how far you can go in two years, as opposed to picking things up and dropping them on and off for literally the first 20 years of my life. I mean, how insane is this? You don't have to become the absolute best at what you're trying to do to experience massive change in your life. The powers of self-discipline, commitment and consistency are untapped potential for most people. Consistency brings massive change no matter what, because instead of just living day to day, you start to have a purpose. You get home from work knowing what you're going to do. You wake up in the morning excited about your project. You spend your weekends doing something meaningful. And you know, two years later I can kind of connect the dots in hindsight. But to anyone who decides to start and commit, I promise you, it will take you places too. That's it for this week's video, thanks so much for watching, stay tuned for next week's video and if you haven't already make sure you subscribe to this channel, drop a comment, a thumb up. If you want to download my free 50 people who do PDF, click down below, it contains over 50 interviews of productivity experts. And yeah, that's it, thanks so much for watching, see you next week, enjoy the journey you're on.